Good morning, Kristen. How are you? Oh, I am good. Yes. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Kristen Snowden. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in the state of California, but this is not therapy. This is just meant to be a psychoeducational lecture. I do a lot of subjects uh, regarding relationships, relationship dynamics, some addiction recovery. Um, so while this is also appropriate for maybe partners of people who've struggled or are in relationship with people who are substance abuse addicts, sex addicts, this can also be applied to other couples who are just really struggling with uh, infidelity, unhealthy relationship dynamics, extreme unhappiness in the coupleship and trying to kind of figure out what's been going on, put a name to their pain and struggles and kind of process this. So when you do go into couples therapy, you have a better understanding and language for, for what's going on here. Because sometimes this can be extremely confusing and you just don't even really understand and can't grab hold of like, what is happening here? Just why is this so miserable? Why is this not working? Why I'm in so much pain? Why do these patterns keep coming up, et cetera? So that's kind of my goal. Um, today specifically, I was kind of referencing a book called The Trail Bond. The Betrayal Bond, this is by Pat Carnes. Uh, he's a pretty famous guy in the world of sex addiction, kind of considered one of the pioneers. Now, I wanted to caveat this discussion before I start kind of educating on the subject matter, which is um, the subtitle to this is Breaking Free of Exploitive Relationships. I want to kind of see or help you explore and identify if there are unhealthy relationship patterns going on between you and your primary partner, or even just family members, friends, colleagues, et cetera. Um, there can be unhealthy toxic relationship dynamics going on in any type of relationship. Now, talking about unhealthy relationship dynamics has nothing to do and is completely separate from your partner having addiction issues. So if you're having marital problems, if there are unhealthy communication skills or unhealthy dynamics that are present in your relationship, that is never an excuse for your partner to be acting out in the way he or she might be acting out outside of the marriage with an addiction, um, relapsing, et cetera. So I want you to know when we're talking about this subject matter, we're just talking about your relationship dynamics, which has nothing to do with outside behavior, outside the relationship, which has nothing to do with you. So please, please hear that. So, um, Pat Carnes um, starts talking about there might be some unhealthy relationship dynamics if you have the following kind of symptoms that exist. Uh, when you potentially obsess about people who have hurt you, even when they're long gone, so maybe you're preoccupied or fantasize about and wonder about them even when you don't want to, so you just wish that person wouldn't take up space in your brain anymore, but you find that they do. When you continue to seek contact with people who you know will cause you further pain. So again, even if it's family members, colleagues, ex-friends, that they might deeply hurt you, betrayed you, but you still find yourself kind of um, reaching out to them to maybe like fix the relationship or see if you can um, rekindle it. When you go overboard to help people who have been destructive or painful to you. When you continue being a team member, when obviously things are becoming destructive or maybe there's no reciprocity or willingness on the other side. When you continue um, attempts to get people who are clearly using you to like you. So even though you know that the, the relationship's imbalanced, uneven, you, it almost causes you to trigger to work harder to have them kind of um, engage in an even way when they're not showing any signs of wanting to do that. When you again and again trust people who have proved to be unreliable. When you are unable to distance yourself, when you're unable to distance yourself from unhealthy relationship dynamics. When you want to be understood by those who clearly don't care. So maybe they've shown no interest in engaging, but you still just try and keep trying to explain, re-explain, re-explain, re-defend yourself, um, show why you're kind of worthy to fight for or fight to be in the relationship with. When you choose to stay in conflict with others, when it would cost you nothing to walk away. Um, when you persist 
in trying to convince people that there is a problem, but they're not willing to listen. When you are loyal to people who've betrayed you consistently, when you are attracted to untrustworthy people, when you keep damaging secrets about exploitation or abuse to usually protect that person or protect that relationship, or when you continue to contact with an abuser who acknowledges no responsibility or any validation for the abuse that might have um, occurred. So those are some signs to kind of maybe if you see that present in any of your relationships, it's time to kind of take a step back and start really exploring, you know, what is this person? What is this relationship in my life? Why do I, why am I extremely invested in keeping it? And what's going on here? You know, how does this relationship serve her, him or her? And how is this relationship serving me? So um, the, there's to toxic relationship dynamics can involve a lot of what we call gaslighting. So that's kind of when another person uh, kind of overpowers you by telling you what your reality should be. Um, so, you know, no, I'm not doing that on the computer. No, you shouldn't be asking me where that money went. No, you're the crazy person. You need to go to therapy. Everything's fine here. You're always the problem. Everything's harmonious when you're not you know, complaining, et cetera. So that's kind of gaslighting because that's not acknowledging and validating that you're in a state of struggle. A lot of toxic relationship dynamics have that present and so can lead you to feel very confused about what's going on. You know, why am I so unhappy? Why do I feel so unsafe in this situation? Or why am I so resentful and angry, but you can't quite put your finger on it and you can't really feel justified or have the evidence, so to speak, to kind of back it up when you're engaged in these arguments and conflicts with other people. So this, this discussion and this exploration that we're gonna be talking about right now is kind of meant to help you put name to your current or past or future relational struggles. So you can kind of identify it, call it out, and hopefully help change these patterns when you see them coming up. So, uh, Dr. Karn says that some of the five most common toxic relationship dynamics tend to exist in the following. So there's what he calls a seduction type relationship dynamic where um, th that's called the abuse, that's called the person that is kind of instigating or perpetrating the abuses and exploitations in the relationship, let's call them the abuser, um, where they kind of really go out of their way to seduce and get you to kind of trust and depend on them um, and kind of ignite your desire to focus on the fantasy of what this relation could be or how great it used to be or all the wonderful things that, that could come from this relationship if only he would or if only she would do the following instead of kind of behave, uh, paying attention and focusing on the facts. So um, just as a comment I was thinking of recently is, uh, Someone wrote me a while back and said, uh, my husband says he's leaving me. I'm pretty sure he's leaving me for another woman. Um, I'm really scared. We have an infant that I'm trying to take care of. And I, I'm fighting so hard to keep this marriage, you know, but he's just saying, I'm not interested. I need to leave you in order for me to miss you. And no, I'm not having an affair, even though she is pretty confident at this point it is. And so I, all I just kind of did is I just encouraged her to just kind of work with the facts versus um, she was kind of living in the, he used to be such a great man. He used to be making our family a priority and he's just kind of changed into a different person. So that's kind of what I'm trying to say is, is pay attention to how he's treating you and how he's, you know, what kind of priority level he's putting you at at this moment versus the, the, fondness of the fantasy of what it used to be like or what you hope that it'll be like at this time. So in other types of relationship dynamics that are unhealthy are terror and fear. So fear and terror are intense emotions. So when we're talking about very uh, visceral, intense arguing, physical abuse, deep emotional abuse, uh, deep intensity and uh, I could think of examples, car chases, screaming and fighting. Uh, so these create fear and terror and intense emotions. But there's a school of thought that also believes that sometimes those, those intense feelings of fear and emotion can be kind of intertwined and kind of mixed up in your neuropsychology and, and cause you to 
mistake it for sexual arousal as well. So um, it can be intermixed with increased sexual arousal. And then in that fear and uh, can also form this kind of deep attachment. So we're in this state of fear. It's really scary. Um, so I, it might trigger this, this open myself up to have like this deeper bond with this person because we've kind of engaged in this like deep uh, kind of brutal moments with each other and made it out. And, and there's really great maybe makeup sex or something like that going on. So pay attention to that. It's often coupled with seduction that kind of happens in the aftermath. Um, power over. So the relationships that are about someone having power over you. So these are, the abusers are the types of people who take advantage of their positions of power in order to seduce the vulnerable. Uh, so again, it can be, you know, people in the church taking advantage of people under who work under them, people in uh, positions of power in businesses or government positions, taking advantage of, of people who they feel like won't speak up for themselves or stand up for themselves or they have some kind of financial dependency going on with them so power over and that's kind of what they look for for an exploitive um, situation as an example you have to think uh therapists there's a law that you're not allowed to have any kind of romantic or even friendship relationships with clients because the idea is is you're in a they're in a vulnerable position sharing very vulnerable information with you and you should never be interacting with them outside the professional environment because uh they're they're vulnerable to you they're they're exposing their raw thoughts and feelings and confidential information you shouldn't be going into like business engagements with them seeing out them outside of, of a professional structure you know friendships stuff like that is just not appropriate because there's a power over dynamic that you can should never abuse or exploit. Then there's this allure of intimacy um, where these type of abusers give kind of almost a seductiveness of, I am one to like, if you please me and fall in line with what I want, then I will give you loyalty and closeness and kind of reward you. Um, and those types of people who are in those types of environments feel this kind of loyalty to this person, even though they know they're doing, you know, unlawful things, unhealthy things, abusive, exploitive things, and they'll maybe choose to hold their secrets for that person or kind of continue to compromise their values in order to, to please them and keep that person in their life because there's this allure of like, oh, he or she's made me special. He's brought me into his or her circle. Um, I want to keep that loyalty and I feel good for doing that. And then of course, there's the dynamics where you bring in religion or spirituality, right? So you can't leave this relationship even if it's abusive because you know our religion doesn't believe in divorce or um, there's people who obviously, again, are positions in the church who will use the vulnerability and the emotional vulner, uh, kind of exposure that comes with spirituality and faith-based kind of concepts to say, oh, and I can be a medium between you and this higher power and then let's go have sex or an extramarital affair or make you touch me inappropriately or vice versa. Um, this will be our little secret. And so you can see that there's definitely an allure and a power that can happen when you bring religion and spirituality into the dynamics. So um, some things to look for in these dynamics to kind of help you identify them are um, when abusers, uh, Dr. Carnes kind of talks about how abusers, you'll notice that they kind of believe in their uniqueness. Maybe their, their seductive draw is, is, they feel very powerful in that, in that area of power over or you know rules don't apply to me, I'm kind of entitled to do these kind of things. Um, and then you feel, um, the abusee feels special for kind of being in that select, you know, elitist group of uniqueness, of specialness. Um, so they're willing to keep secrets and again, uh, compromise their values or kind of ignore their gut and intuition of, ooh, this doesn't feel right. And I don't feel like I can be myself or I can be loved, but apparently this is, this is special, like this is something. Um, I remember I was in like an unhealthy relationship when I was in college 
And um, my partner at the time was an extremely jealous person. Uh, and so and he was away and because he was very jealous, he needed me to contact him regularly because I was in, still in college and he was worried about me getting into college shenanigans, who knows. So I was running around constantly emailing him, contacting him to kind of show him I was tracking and I was <laughs> kind of almost reporting to him to show him that I was still being a good girl. And all of my friends were coming out and going like, Kristen, he's changing you. We don't like this. You're bending over backwards. Like you don't need to prove yourself to another person. This isn't okay. And I remember my response to them was, well, they just don't know what love is. Mm -hmm. You know, they just don't know like that. You're just supposed to sacrifice everything. And those are things that he would say to me, right? Like, I know you love me when you're doing these things, going out of your way and bending over backward. But at the same time, it was, it was causing me so much stress, so much anxiety. I wasn't myself. I was cutting people out of my life. And because I was like, oh, you don't get me, don't judge me. Um, and so that, that's kind of an example of, of that, where there's this uniqueness, you know, there, you, there's an alignment through this special kind of thing. And it causes you to kind of ignore feedback from other people of what they're saying. So for those of you who maybe, um, and this might be tough to hear, so let me just uh, caveat that. But there's, he has a section on talking about uh, a repetitive cycle of abuse and often some stuff that comes through compulsive sexual violence. And so I'm just gonna kind of list some of the things that might be present, some of the things that you may be facing as a consequence of being in the particular type of dynamic that you're in right now. So are there ever, is there ever pressure to use alcohol or drugs before sex? Either you've pressured yourself because you want to have, well, you don't really want to have sex, but you feel like you need to kind of do it to keep the person happy. And so you might want to numb it out and drink before that, or maybe they've encouraged you to have drugs or alcohol before it to make you more liberated and free to do kind of the things that they want to do sexually. So, you know, explore that if it's a genuine desire for you to do it, or if you feel kind of more coerced and under duress in order to do that. Insistence um, of the use of sexual performance enhancers, derogatory comments uh, um, during sex, forced involvement in unsafe sex or group sex, forced risk for unwanted pregnancies, requirement to undergo cosmetic surgery. So again, I'm going to do these type of things to maybe enhance my looks to keep that person because I don't want to lose them or they've expressed that they like these kind of enhancements. But again, I don't want to or I'm getting pressured to do it. Um, humiliating or degrading practices of any kind, some types of dress and role play. And again, it's something that maybe you don't want to do, but you're getting pressured into it because that other person's asking you to do it. Public sex, such as exhibitionism, voyeurism, swapping, use of bondage, or any kind of rape or sexual assault. So those are obviously extremely serious symptoms of a relationship dynamic. And, that, and again, if that, that stuff is, is present in your relationship at all, I would really encourage you. Sometimes those are very embarrassing and we want to keep those topics to ourselves and not share them and there's a lot of shame so I would just encourage you you know maybe find a certified sex addiction therapist or somebody like that and, and talk about it uh, talk about it with a professional or other people who you find to be trusted but those are not secrets to keep within the relationship those need to be talked about um, so a few other things are um, one of the things that I actually liked most, which is why I was presenting on this um, topic, is I found this really great kind of chart on what he talks about, which is, is, is your relationship, do you sometimes ref confuse intimacy with intensity? And um, he kind of creates this chart to kind of help you explore when you're engaging with this particular person do you confuse this feeling of closeness and connection with just actually the fact that there was this crazy intensity? So for example, you know, me exa the example of me running around 
trying everything to keep that person happy and telling them where I am and reporting to them. I, at that time, you would have probably asked me and I would have felt like we had this really intense, amazing bond. But what it really was, was me feeling really intensely stressed about wanting to please that person and have him validate that I was a good, valuable person. And that, that was my rush and my high. It wasn't real connection because, you know, real love and real connection doesn't ask me to run around and alter my entire schedule in the day and suck all my joy away just so he can make sure I'm not having sex with or laughing with or hanging out with another man. Um, so, you know, that's again, that's where you don't talk about, you don't focus on the fantasy of what you're hoping for or thinking something is, you focus on the facts of, of what's really being asked of you and what you're doing to yourself in your life in order to accommodate this other person. So that's the really big thing you explore. But so this really quick, the uh, intimacy versus intensity. So when you're exploring, okay, is, am I in a relationship that's just intense and a lot of drama and stuff being thrown around? and I'm confusing it for like a deep connection and intimacy, these are the some things that you need to think about. So with a, in an intimate, connected, healthy, vulnerable relationship, the roles are mutual, respectful, equal. With an intensity drama focused relationship, the role is always victim and victimizer. So blaming you did this to me, I swear I didn't, defending myself, et cetera. In a healthy relationship, the feelings are passion, vulnerability, safety. I can share these things with me, you know, with myself about you, and I can be open and honest, and there's mutual exchanges. Feelings are fear and arousal. So the way I interpret that is um, I don't want to tell him what I did here or there. I want to keep this from him because he's going to get upset about this. I'm going to say it this way because I know that's not going to um, trigger him or her. Um, and then arousal of like, wow, this is really intense and exciting. And, and wow, you know, uh, commitment in a healthy relationship is involved and enduring. And, you know, there's discussion about it. Uh, commitment in an unhealthy drama intense relationship is one in one out. So one always kind of trying to prove their worth to keep that person in and then someone else pushing the other one out and trying to keep, you know, running after each other, kind of dogs running after their tails kind of thing. Uh, the prospects of a healthy relationship is their safety, there's patience, there's understanding that we're flawed people and it's going to be great and sometimes it's going to be flawed. Whereas uh, the prospects in an unhealthy, intense, drama-seeking relationship is threats of betrayal, you know, if you don't give it to me, I'm going to go get it somewhere else fear of abandonment, please don't leave me, um, I'll, I'll change, I'll be better in order to keep you here, I'm sorry, what do you want, you know. Anxiety levels in a healthy relationship is, look, I'm feeling uncomfortable, so they, uh, it's a problem, like resolution focus, so look, I'm feeling really uncomfortable with what you said, I'm feeling really uncomfortable with the situation, I don't like the way you talk to this other person, can you please help me feel safe, sure, let's talk about it, let's get to a resolution, validation, understanding where everyone's coming from, whereas an intense relationship is just high drama. So when you're in that anxiety state, you're acting out. So you're not even putting words to it. It's just acting out. Um, problems are in a healthy relationship, there's fair fighting, there's fair discussion, there's not name calling. In an unhealthy one, there's no structure and rules, no holds barred. You're allowed to sling out any kind of crap, any kind of past story, any kind of accusation, and say anything and call any names. Um, development, uh, there's in a healthy relationship, there's high growth potential, high growth focus that you guys want to grow together, be healthy together, versus the development of an intense relationship is it's all distraction based. It's one intense moment and one drama moment from the other. So you can't even focus on yourself or growing or um, what's going on here because you're so focused on the intensity of the drama. Um, openness in a healthy relationship. There's no secrets. Uh, there's no like, hey, keep this secret for me. I'm doing this, you know, shady behavior. Hide it. 
uh, for me, be loyal to me, um, versus an intense relationship is lots of secret keeping, lots of keeping information from the other person or asking other people to hold information for another. Conflict, there's negotiation in healthy relationship. In conflict and intense relationships is escalation. So there's no resolution focus. It just gets worse and harder and more difficult. And um, so I think those sometimes can be some aha moments if you're hearing those. I definitely do couples therapy and I, I read those things to clients. And sometimes those are like, ooh, wow, we, we fight in an unfair way and definitely not in a healthy relationship dynamic way. So again, if those things are present in your relationship, I would encourage you guys to please um, go talk to a professional and get that stuff figured out. So in closing, we're going to finish with, okay, I've told you all the things that might be present in the relationship that you need to be concerned about or help identify unhealthy patterns. How do we get out of it? So you need to, one thing that he encourages the most is right now, if your bonding is done in a healthy patterned way, I need to encourage you to explore, you know, your past relationships, your traumas, etc., and see if any of those things play into your current relationship dynamics. Um, he'd encourage to start learning how to bond in healthy, uh, equal, reciprocated ways with either mental health professionals or with safe groups and support groups. So whether you're in 12-step meetings or betrayed partners um, groups, or um, you have identified a group of healthy people or family members is to work on those healthy bondings where things are, you know, when I just gave that chart, everything in the healthy relationship dynamics column matches that type of relationship. So you work on that's what healthy bonding is. Explore the toll that this particular relationship has had on you. Um, what have been the negative consequences? Um, I like to kind of call this stuff like a step one. So it was, you know, uh, Rob, always taught me to do step ones and that even though you know you had some kind of standard or value or moral uh this relationship caused you to kind of do x y and z so even though i would never think that i would have sex with someone when i didn't want to you know i feel like i got coerced to regularly have sex with this person when i did not feel safe or comfortable or anything like that even though I, I believe in following the law. When I found out this person was breaking the law, uh, he or she asked me to keep secrets and I kept them and I felt awful about it. Even though, and you can kind of go through all your morals, all your values, everything that you hold dear to your heart of what's important to you, what you thought you would never do, that your non-negotiables, that I would never tolerate emotional abuse, physical abuse, someone stealing money from me, um, this relationship, dynamic has caused me to kind of ignore that. And that can be really profound to kind of do 25 of those and find out how the relationships had negative consequences on you. Um, he, he says at that time when you start realizing that um, the pain from the relationship can instead turn into grieving um, and you can have, can kind of transform healthy anger of, you know, I'm going to take my power back and these are the ways that this is not okay that I've been victimized and I'm going to breathe, grieve the loss of what I thought this relationship was going to be, who this person I thought was going to be in my life. And I, and I can kind of start moving it on from feeling like the, the victim, being feeling like a blaming anger um, and kind of, kind of slowly start taking your pa power back, transform the suffering of the relationship into meaning, and then also understand the patterns that person so it does the role you might play in that relationship dynamic. So it doesn't keep playing it out with either that same person or other future relationships. You can also, uh, something he said that I highlighted that I liked was you can be supportive of others without doing for them. So that's being boundary. I can support someone in their recovery. I can support someone in their journey without me doing anything for them. Um, and then only help when truly needed or specifically requested, right? So it's not my job to anticipate that person's every need. Um, it's their job to identify their own needs and then to clearly uh, communicate them to me. I would like you to help me in this way. Please help me in X, Y, and Z way. And avoid helping those 
who betray, exploit, harm you in a regular way. You know, they don't, they don't get your help if they're <laughs> abusing or hurting you. Um, developing boundaries. I have other webinars on how to develop boundaries. These are paramount to moving into a healthier dynamic. Um, they can also be very empowering. Uh, trauma resolution, I mentioned that. So kind of getting to a trauma therapist, doing some EMDR work, somatic experiencing, whatever, to kind of work through the past. Because the idea, you know, if you've ever read The Body Keeps Score from Bessel van der Kolk, your childhood traumas or other relational uh, traumas or previous past history traumas with that same person still present themselves today. If you kind of don't work through them, process through them, kind of shake out the... Uh, limbic system fight flight or freeze part of your brain that's always going to come um guns blazing it kind of it's an involuntary response and if you want to know more about that uh look up my webinars on betrayal trauma and i'll kind of explain that and are you experiencing trauma in your relationship that'll help you understand what you need to work through there and then the big big part is with all that information you can then change the system change the relationship system so with all that new information you have and all the work that you've done, you can respond differently to that person. You can either choose to get out of that relationship and go no contact or avoid them, or just again, all the ways that you used to respond, you just don't respond that way. You know, you find yourself not running on that hamster wheel anymore and you kind of step off and you get clear on what you need to do to stay in line with your values and goals. And then develop a sense of self. That's developing who am I outside of this relationship? Who am I? What do I stand for? What are my most important values? What are my non-negotiables? What are my goals? Start small, work up from there. It's great work to do either with a group or with a professional. Um, or even if you have a sponsor, you run a 12-step program, that obviously will get you through that too. Recovery plan. Um, create accountability with your professionals and your support group. And, um, and a safety plan too. If this is an exploitive, abusive relationship, sometimes your best thinking um, might still come out of the, the trauma or your reactionary type brain. So it's good to have a safety plan and accountability plan with like a professional to know that if this happens again, I'm gonna pick up the phone and call this person. I'm gonna go this place to try it again, make sure that you stay safe and you stay healthy in this environment. Um, healthy relationships and intimacy are the freedom and safety to be vulnerable with boundaries and be yourself without fear or shame. So remember the goal, if, if any relationship you feel like you have to withhold this part of you, not share this part of you, um, you walk away feeling very in shame, like you constantly have to defend yourself, like you're always needing to prove your value and worth to another person, um, you're constantly hurt by your exchanges, I would just really encourage you to um, explore what's going on there because there is a way out of it. It's not something that you need to continue to endure. And that's it. Lots though. There, that's lots of information. I was thinking when you were doing the initial list and, and I was like, Oh, I've done that. Oh, I've done that. You know, there were a couple of them that touched on, um, uh, you know, things. And it was, some of them are with a you know, primary, you know, significant other relationship, but, but even you know, work relationships, I, you know, it was like, I was like, this isn't just about, you know, this person that I'm, you know, married to, or is my significant other, you know, I, I thought I've given away pieces of myself in, in work relationships, you know, as well, multiple times, it was multiple different employers, you know, kind of abuse. And you know, I was thinking when you're talking about um, uh, the seduction and abuser, I thought it, it really is that pattern too, because if somebody just comes at you and is abusive right from the get go, you know, you, you know, you, you probably walk away. So it's that seduction of pulling you in, you know, and then um, when you talked about your relationship where you know, the isolation it's like you know um creating a system where now your friends don't understand you they don't understand love so so i just need to do what i need to do to keep this primary relationship because this person loves me and he, look look what he wants me, you know he wants to know where i am because he wants you know because he loves me right, you know, I mean, right. The, the whole, yeah he loves me so yeah yeah they're a pile of you know what i needed to say yeah i didn't even know what i didn't even know 
Yeah, well, yeah, but I think that's, you know, so typical is, you know, because it is all of this and, you know, and I, and, you know, I see it re repeatedly. And I think with abuse, you know, it isn't just physical abuse, it's that emotional and like cutting, you know, get, getting uh, cut off from, you know, other people that, you know, can be a support or would have a, ha have a different lens, at, you know, uh, in looking at your relationship, you know, your friends are saying this, we don't like who you're turning into and, and all of that. And so, you know, cutting them out quiets those voices. So, um, and also, you know, then further isolate. So, um, you know, I was thinking, um, uh, and there are you know, the, the power differential, you know, I see that all the time too, mm -hmm. and particularly, you know, the hashtag me too movement was because there are a lot of people that are in a more powerful position. I really need this job. And I've been in that. I really need this job. So, you know, um, uh, it, it, there's a power up. And so, you know, I want to say I suck it up and do what I need to do to, you right. know, keep that but you know but there was that compromise of what my integrity is you know in, in those um you know in those situations um uh i i was thinking too with the um you know like it's like we can do these things and you know or get out of the relationship and there are some of them you know we can't i 100 percent agree with the grieving the loss of what the relationship you know this fantasy that i thought i had or even what i had you know back here it was you know oh this person was so loving and caring and they showed up for me and all of this and now they don't like you're talking about you know the client that um uh you know where the the person's not showing up for them and looking at it here's where we are realistically right now even though you want this and you have a young child and you want it to be this happy you know family you know that isn't what this person's showing up to be so you know having to grieve and move on from that and identify the the realistic things um but i thought it's so hard too it's like so you know you, you know it's like we you know we, we just need to do this but it you know i thought every one of those steps is painful and difficult you know, and, and looking at it realistically and being able to tolerate other people's voices saying, you know, I, you know, I see this with you or I see this with this relationship or even listening to the, the voice within myself. Um, you know, you talked about Bessel van der Kock and we talked about it briefly before we started too, is like, you know, there, there's lots of people that are enduring this trauma, you know, that end up with, with, you know, autoimmune um, illnesses or what, but with some significant um, physical challenges. I was thinking too, with the traumas, it's like, there's always this under, even if the lip service is, oh, I love you and all of this kind of stuff, there's that undercurrent, like the, you know, in the gut where it's always kind Kind of like this isn't safe this isn't safe this isn't safe but they're telling me this is safe this is you know i love you and you know if you just do these things what but there's this um disconnect i think that's the word i was looking for is there's this disconnect between what's being said and heard and what my emotional state is like the where where my guts are saying this isn't safe but my head is going oh but it is oh but it is you know so um uh learning to listen to that unrest and not be um um uh, you use coerced and i thought that was a good word coerced into thinking you know things are different than than what i really sense and believe they are so it's re but really tough stuff particularly when the lip service has all been you know if you just do or but you know i love you so much you know, right. you know. this is what love is yeah exactly it's yeah. supposed to feel like you're walking on eggshells all day every day <laughs> yeah and i had somebody else the other day that uh, mentioned um uh she's she's a betrayed partner and she was talking about the emotional letdown like you know, it like the intensity was gone, you know, like it was chaos. And now he's in recovery and it's, bo it's boring, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the struggle in that. And I thought, yeah, because the intensity is like, everything is chaos and everything is stirred up. And it's, it's challenging to dial back, you know, eight notches and go, oh, oh wait, this is okay. You know, it, it, I don't really want the chaos, but gosh, it's really boring now. And, you know, try to find things to replace um, uh, that give joy and peace without having to constantly be in the, you know, elevated state. So, yeah, well, and that comes up because the, the Q and a is saying, um, mm -hmm. something similar to that, that she says, I, as a wife of a recovering sex addict, I find that I get triggered a lot by my past, 
along with what he's done. I've been in recovery for several, several years now, but need help dealing with triggers over old things. And <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. My experience has been, you know, speaking of Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps Score, I find it amazingly intense how much you, your, your own will to get over something does not outdo that amazingly strong fight, flight, or freeze limbic system, you know, um, sympathetic nervous system that acts, it, it's just this separate caveman in you that um, is there to fight to make you feel, to, to try to encourage, it just, its sole purpose is to keep you alive. It doesn't take emotions into consideration, doesn't take the um, complexities of human dynamics and human relationships into consideration. All it knows is this stuff happened before, I've stored it up in my brain to tell me that this is dangerous, this is bad, run, 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 if this happens again. And so just a song, a um, similar tone that he or she used to take, that used to be the old version of him or her, um, seeing a restaurant or anything takes you back there like you wish that it never would, you know, and you wish that it wouldn't take up space in your brain anymore to, as you thought of the affair partners or um, the amount of money that's been lost or the scary situations that happen because of his or her acting out behavior. <clears throat> and uh, that stuff I find can, I've heard of great progress made by people who use EMDR, um, somatic experiencing, um, and if you have some other, I, I know the body keeps score kind of lists a, a long list of things. And I do talk about that. So um, for the anonymous attendee who commented, um, I have a webinar that I've done before that's called, um, are you experiencing trauma in your relationship that talks about kind of how to treat these involuntary triggers that we wish that we could push the button and make it stop but it's there and I'll tell you that there are ways to kind of reprogram and rewire the brain so that it doesn't come at you the way that it does. And I agree. And, and I think, you know, I personally have used EMDR, um, uh, you know, on some specific things. So, so, you know, uh, we, I had somebody a, a while back that was upset because they, you know, I had said the EMDR is usually a short term thing. Well, it's short term when I'm working on one specific thing, if there's right. like, high degrees of trauma and there's, you know, incident after incident, you, then it's going to take longer. But like I had a thing and I needed to go work on it. And so, you know, a couple of sessions of EMDR and gratefully that particular thing has not, um, you know, caused me, um, it, you know, I can think of it, but it doesn't cause me the, you know, the, the gun wrenching, clinching, you know, it, it like just doesn't, it just doesn't anymore. And, and I'm grateful for that. It's, it's like, it's, um, given me the ability to view it without getting all the emotion in it. So, so I think things like that, um, and I do, when you talked about reprogramming, I really do believe that we can uh, lay new sidewalks. So, yeah. you, so to speak, new you know, wiring. Yeah, 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 it is. Yeah, yeah. Pathways. Yeah, yes, neural pathways, whatever. But like, I think we, you know, so, uh, cause I had another situation that was, um, you know, and I was like, I, I, I can choose. And so, you know, I started choosing some um, positive thoughts um, you know, and uh, looking at things from a different way. And, and this was not a huge one. This was, a, you know, a little one, but I would like it, it changed it for me. I was able to look at it, you know, from a different lens and, you know, I even found some gratitude and things like that. And it really helped. And again, you know, it wasn't this, you know, <gasps> trigger, you know, every, every time, you know, I, I you know, it, it's, it's moved to a different place and, and that's been helpful so so I do encourage you to get some professional help with that because yeah getting because those triggers are like you know you're blindsided you don't know when they're gonna pop up so it's almost like you're you know on edge waiting for the next one too and that's just right. like not you know not a uh, not a safe place to to come from you know either so so there is can be bewildering because you it's the sign that you're like never gonna move beyond this so even if your partner's made these great changes or you maybe have these great relational dynamics that are present now, it, 
and then this happens and you feel completely triggered and brought back to the old feelings, you're just like, wow, I, I'm never going to get beyond this. And yeah. Spend it. Or I haven't made any progress and you have, you know, you know, like there's lots of progress, but you know, there's those little, you know, there's those little things that, you know, are, are tripping you up every now and then, but you know, there is, you know, there is help for that. Any other questions or comments on lots of great information? So, so the book, uh, you know, the, the, it's written from an older framework. So right. if you read it, you know, it, it, it probably will feel a little more like codependent stuff. So uh, as we always say in the 12 step meetings, take what you need and leave the rest. There's some great content in there. Use what you can use and um, uh, ignore the rest. So, so there's another question in the nine months of therapy with my CSAT for betrayal trauma, the narcissist and psychological abuse. And that took such a toll on me was never specifically addressed or validated grief and loss also was not part of the recovery. Do you have any book recommendations so that I can work on this myself? I know I'm thinking for some, the narcissistic and psychological abuse that took, um, well, cause this is the other thing that I wonder again, speaking of that list of, am I still in an exploitive relationship has, because it wasn't addressed, the narcissistic and psychological abuse that took a toll on you was never addressed and validated. Does that mean that like it was never even talked about. So maybe that your partner doesn't own it at this point too, because that, that alone can, can be quite powerful to maybe go back in to um, a, a professional and talk about like when you said X, Y, and Z to me, so I, I know a lot of my clients, a lot of their, um, the stuff that lingers the most with them are when their their partners were in their acting out phase, they were kind of willing to say anything to justify it. So there's a lot of like, I love, I never loved you. Um, you know, if you weren't such a prude, all these kind of brutal things of if you weren't just, you know, so boring and, and such a rule fault, you know, nobody likes you. These things that uh, are extremely abusive that even if, that person finds recovery and comes back to it and goes, oh, that was just me in my addict mode or I was just like in a dark place myself, even though they've given this rationale and this justification for them kind of saying this stuff out of just like pain, kind of almost like a toddler screaming at you, like I hate you, um, even though they obviously don't hate their parent. It, it burns deep in these people's psyches and they can't forget they're like are you sure because you told me when we got married you settled and you'd never been that attracted to me so I'm really confused about how you want to be with me now and now everything even all the stuff that they're doing today to show that they value you or they love you or that this this partnership and relationship is a priority all that stuff you need to talk about it you need to talk about it to the partner. You need to see his or her face. You need to hear about why they said that. Um, if they even have memories of it, um, it may seem like you don't want to go back and hash that stuff. But to me, and maybe you can say this or not, Tammy, but I feel like those are the wounds that last a really, really, really long time. Yeah, well, and yeah, I have lots of, of comments on this. First of all, um, uh, you know, I don't hear, you know, because I, I yeah, I'm, I'm kind of wondering what um, the, the, the plan is. And um, just, be, you know, I know lots of CSATs. There's a lot of great CSAT therapists, but not all of them really understand working with partners. And, uh, uh, and even within the CSAC community, there's a number of them that uh, still align with the codependency uh, model where, you know, you're part of the problem, whatever. Um, and some of them, unfortunately, will still give language to the, you should just get over it because look, he's doing such a great job, you know, right. and um, I don't espouse to that. Um, you know, you know, I think, um, 
I, I can't think of the only book I can think of right now is um, out of the doghouse because it talks about rebuilding trust and it goes through this is what you've done and this is how you've hurt your partner and so I think um, that might be one to start with to you know yeah. to kind of look at that but I think um, I would have some serious questions for the therapist um, I don't know you know if you've done a therapeutic disclosure I don't know um, if you've done your so if you have typically as part of that you've done an impact letter and as part of the impact letter you would be sharing all of that information of how you know this is you know truly hurt and devastated you and um, you know uh, we, we talk about it and you know Kristen just talked about it too it is you know it is grieving the loss of what you thought you had you know grieving you know I always say when people get married and say I do they didn't know they were saying I do to all of this you know and there's there aren't manuals on you know when you know when you've been married X amount of time this is gonna happen and you're gonna you know and here's how you're gonna handle. there isn't you know and so I hear you reaching out for uh, support I, I really um, hope that you are plugging into the betrayed trauma or I mean betrayed partner drop-in groups there's one today at 1230 Pacific time and there's great support with other betrayed partners there I think you'll find some you know some help and support you know in that there's other you know groups and webinars on our site as well so but I, you know I think with that I would you know I would bring it up to the therapist I would say you know I don't I don't hear this um, and um, you know uh, w where is your impact letter how are you um, going to uh, yeah, to move forward with that. And on um, Dr. Rob's podcast series, there's a number of um, podcasts that talk about betrayed partners and just relationship stuff. You may find some, you know, help in there too. Yeah. And I, um, speaking of all that kind of stuff, oh, and here's a more benign book. So it's not focused on um, sex addiction, but um, John Gottman's What Makes Love Last does yeah. talk about how like, um, betrayal can happen in so many different forms as you're saying there was you know narcissistic abuse and psychological abuse and so it does talk about how you really have to work to kind of repair um those dynamics in the relationship and, it, and it's a pretty pretty quick read um for you on that and for your partner as well yeah that, that's a great suggestion so um there's a comment i tried to validate my experience with my husband's narcissistic abuse by telling him I need his empathy regarding his treatment. He read out of the doghouse, so he actually uses the book against me, oh, by telling me I'm not trying to change his, by telling me I'm trying to change his brain when I ask for empathy. Well, unfortunately, people can take things out of context and twist things. And oh, right. unfortunately, oh, right. an addict is really good at that because, you know, like you talked about defending at all costs, you know, down in the, you know, limbic part of your brain. So it's, I'm going to defend this and I'm going to blame you rather than take responsibility. So right. any other questions or comments? Well, I, I, we're basically out of time. So thank you for joining us. Kristen, thank you for a great topic for um, those of you that are joining us next week. So we've got um, uh, hosts for each of the weeks of the month now. So we've got different topics on Wednesday morning at this time, Wednesday morning, 930 Pacific time, but it, wherever, whatever time zone you're in, um, join us each week and um, come back next month and Kristen will deliver another great topic to us. Hopefully. Yeah. Thank you everyone for joining. And again, you can always email me questions at Kristen Snowden, MFT at gmail.com. And I also have a website, www.kristin, K-R-I-S-T-I-N, Snowden.com. And um, if there's any additional questions or topics that you're interested in. Great. Thank you. Thank you.